For students, they can sometimes involve high stakes testing or feel anonymous in some ways, or they might represent courses that um, students might not be so motivated to take. So Rebuild and CRLT are collaborating to develop a pro proposal for how these courses can be rethought. Um, we've heard a number of reasons why departments and faculty might want to participate in that, and just to list a few of those, um, one is that we're interested in thinking about a collaborative course design model. Really an opportunity to bring together a group of faculty that might teach this in different semesters, along with folks from CRLT who would provide support around the teaching side, the technology, the assessment, so that there's really a team working on this and the whole load doesn't fit, fall on the one faculty member. So to take advantage of that collaborative course design method, another reason might be to infuse this particular category of courses with evidence-based pedagogies, with some more about what we know about um, pedagogies that are helpful for all students to learn in a given course. Um, another reason might be to help faculty take advantages of innovations. These might be technology innovations, and again, they might be difficult to do as an individual, and this process would make that possible. Um, and then finally, we've heard from some departments where this might be a, a useful form of intergenerational mentoring, where assistant professors might come into these courses, and having a group to work with could be useful mentoring as they figure out how to teach this type of course and maybe to take them over. So there's a range of different reasons that, that faculty might be involved here. Um, we have gotten and we will continue to get lots of feedback um, about this initiative. Um, we're in the process of preparing a proposal and that has been informed by conversations with, uh, with faculty, with staff, with students across the campus. And this seminar is another place to, to continue that conversation. And really what we're doing is we're looking at programs around the country um, that have similar types of initiatives or that have um, done innovative work that can inform our foundational course initiative thinking. So um, I'm very excited to be able to introduce today's speakers who've been involved in um, one such initiative at Purdue University. It's called IMPACT, uh, which stands for Instruction Matters, Purdue Academic Course Transformation. Um, and as Chantal was saying, having a good acronym is like it's half the battle. <coughs> Um, so Dr. Uh, Chantal Lebeck Bristol um, and Dr. George Hollich are with us today from Purdue University. I've known Chantal for many years through our disciplinary association and through our Big Ten Academic Alliance of Teaching Centers. Um, she is currently the director of the Center for Instructional Excellence at Purdue, where she's been director since 2012. That center houses the IMPACT project, and so she's really been in charge of this whole effort. She is a professor of educational studies and a psychologist by training. Her research areas are effectiveness of teaching approaches, um, especially service learning and first year experiences, um, as well as motivation and self-determination theory. Um, George Hollich is an associate professor of developmental psychology who runs a developmental learning lab, has been the director of undergraduate studies. You are or have been? Or have been. Have, okay. He's also the recipient of a 2013 Outstanding Undergraduate Teaching Award. His interests include language development and expert learning, as well as um, impact of various teaching methods. And he's been through the IMPACT program on a couple of occasions. And their topic today is lessons from a course transformation program at a large research intensive university. And please help me welcome them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. First time visiting Ann Harbor, so um, Great, and uh, Dr. Templin gave me a tour yesterday of the campus, so wonderful, thank you so much. So I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about background, about the program, very broad overview. Uh, George has the most interesting story from his perspective as a faculty member within the program and in time for questions. So IMPACT, you learned the acronym, very good. What is IMPACT? Instruction Matters, Purdue Academic Course Transformation. And our goal with IMPACT, uh, this evolved over time. Uh, when we started back in fall 2011, we were focusing on a particular type of redesign. We have learned now that that's not where the effect is at. So really the goal of IMPACT is to create student-centered, autonomy-supportive, engaging environments. And 
I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But in the research that we've been conducting, um, that is really where the effect of the intervention or the transformation is occurring. So it's much less about what you do, but how you do it. That's really um, the important point here. Since we started this program, you know, we started with only 10 courses in fall 2011. And now we have grown tremendously. So if you're uh, trying to get some lessons learned, this is the end point where we're at right now, but it's not where we started. And if you had told me five years ago that this is where we were going to end, I would have said it's impossible. There's no way we can do that. Uh, but uh, here's, the, here's some of the number. We've uh, worked with 234 faculty, redesigning 225 unique courses. And what's happened, because part of impact is also an institutional cultural transformation at Purdue, is that faculty who have been through the program have started to influence other courses that they were teaching without going through the program formally. Some of them have. George has been through the program twice formally, but others have not. And they have influenced another 113 courses. So now part of our challenge is to keep track of all of these courses that are becoming influenced. Um, so it's an interesting problem to have. In terms of data management, it, it gives the, the data analysts headaches. In terms of professional development outcome, it's wonderful, right? Um, all of the colleges have been touched at Purdue, which is different than other programs. So if you look at the National, uh, National Center NCAT for Academic Transformation, their work typically would focus in one discipline, one area. We've been able to work across all colleges. So what we know is applicable to all fields, all domains. Again, it's about engagement, right? So that part uh, is true across all the different colleges. In terms of by students, if I look at certain semester, for example, in the academic year of 2015-2016, about 73% of the students were registered in an impact course. There are some semesters where we actually hit almost 100% because we actually had done the redesign of our intro comm communication class and our intro English class. Now, we have a, some sustainability issues with the communication, some of these large courses, so it kind of fluctuates, but it's still a, a very high number. If we look at, uh, since the beginning, uh, these are unique, distinct students. Almost 44,000 unique students have gone through the IMPACT program. Again, if you had told me we would do that five years ago, I would have said, I don't think we can. Uh, but, but we have. So these numbers to me are very impressive, it's very large, and we've done that by doing about 30 courses a semester. So our capacity, we work at about 60 courses a year, 30 courses a semester. There's a couple of semesters where we didn't reach our goal, but we're still able to impact some of these large courses, which give us these uh, high numbers of students. Why it works, and this is important, if you're trying to do work of this scope, it would not be possible without the large collaborative effort. Uh, Matt was kind enough to say that CIE is sort of in charge or in the lead, and every time I, I hear that, I, I, I kind of say, yes, sort of, but not really. Because it, it is a collaborative effort. A, a lot of it is done through the collaboration of our office, CIE, but also with the librarians that are participating in um, the redesign of these courses our information technology at Purdue, because many of these transformations are, are going to use some amount of technology. And then the support of the provost office and the president's office is essential, crucial, to be able to do that, that work. Uh, so it's bottom up, top down, but it, it takes all of us to work together. And, and we constantly talk about what the programs mean. And assessment is also part of our, um, our partnership. Very important. It would work. It, otherwise. It's a semester-long faculty development program. So impact is, is intensive. Um, and then we follow the faculty for three iterations after implementation, which is also very important because it doesn't always work the first time around. We're very successful now that we've learned how and what to do and what not to do, but it doesn't always work the first time around. And we need to follow and continue to help the faculty as they make these changes and these tweaks. In the faculty learning community, the 16 weeks, there's three goals that we focus on. First one is that the faculty need to write clear learning outcomes. 
And it's very difficult for them to do that. We work very hard with the faculty. And it's not that they don't have learning outcomes. Often they're in their head. It's not really intentionally put on paper. So we work on figuring out what is it that you want your student to be able to do, know, and appreciate. And pick three to five broad learning outcomes. Then we work on this mapping exercise, assessment map. So we look at, uh, we work with the faculty to examine what is it that you do in your class? What are these assessments, these activities? What are you engaging the students in? And how does that tie back to your learning outcomes? So often we have conversations like, I really love this activity. Great. <coughs> what outcome does it mean? I don't know. Then we talk about that, right? So it needs to go back to the learning outcomes. You either change the outcome or you change the activity. So that's part of the exercise. The third piece is the engagement piece. So as part of the faculty learning community, the faculty <coughs> Uh, work with us in terms of understanding how can I make this environment engaging no matter what the environment I'm faced with whether it's an online environment a face-to-face -face environment or a hybrid type of environment and again it's not about what you do it's how you do it so it's not necessarily group discussion it can be a very good vehicle but you have to do it well if it's not done well it won't lead to a successful redevelopment the motivation piece we draw from self-determination theory. This is part of my research area. I've given you the, the link. It's a very comprehensive website. You can click on the website and get all kind of information about the theory. It's been around for the past 40 years. We use the measures associated with self-determination theory. This is how we operationalize this idea of engagement. <laughs> Student-centered learning, autonomy-supportive learning, we draw from self-determination theory. And from this research, we know that it's a good idea to focus on motivation because it leads to all of these positive outcomes that we're interested in, like lifelong learning, metacognition, problem solving, and greater level of self-determined motivation. Right? So as instructors, we can't motivate the students directly, but we can create this environment which will be engaging. And when that happens, the students then start to feel motivated and engaged, and then that's when the learning outcomes occur. Self-determination theory, and that's what we focus on in that third piece of their redesign, is that we focus on the satisfaction of three basic psychological needs, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And I'll focus on autonomy more for the time that I have here, because if there's one that's the most important creating that environment, it's the feelings of autonomy. <laughs> These are sort of uh, ways in which you can create an environment that is more autonomy supportive. Start with the student as opposed to the discipline, get them interested, arouse their curiosity, present intriguing real problems. People don't like to work on problems that are not real. They really want to dig into something that they can change, that they can make a difference. Give them choices, options, encourage reflections. Too often we try to cram too much content and we don't have time for reflection. We're finding that that is actually uh, detrimental to motivation and engagement. Allow students to find their own path. Not all of these things take more time, so we have to sacrifice a few, a few things for that. So here are some ideas that, that we work with faculty in terms of creating these environments that are more autonomy supportive and engaging. It's not always fun in games. When it's not interesting, provision a, of a com compelling rationale is very important. Why do I have to do this? This is boring, I'm just solving the equation. If it's part of the required elements of the course, but it's not intriguing, there's not really a, a nice way to present it. Why are you asking the students to do that? Providing that compelling rationale goes a long way to creating this engagement. <coughs> Importance of the tone. This idea that as a faculty member, you are with the student, helping them through their learning process. That is so important. If all else fails, this, you could do nothing else but, you know, we're going to work on this together. As opposed to, 
look to your right, look to your left, one of you, two of you will fail. That is not what I'm talking about in terms of the engaging talent. I'm not going to do it for you, there's going to be high expectations, but I'm, I'm here to help you. Office hours, these are the things that I'm going to do to help you succeed. Uh, when we measure it, I talked about metric, when we measure it, it sounds like this, these six bullet points. I feel that my instructor provides me with choice and option. Uh, there's another question that you don't see on there that we use often uh, that is um, very important. The extent to which the instructor cares about me as a person. And I know it kind of sounds touchy-feely, but it's so critical. And now we've tested it with 42,000 students. It works. So here's are some of the ways in which we measure that. I could go much more in depth. I'm not going to the time that I have. So here's a summary. So I didn't talk about competence and relatedness, but we know from the data that we have that if we focus only on competence and mastery of skills, but we forget about creating those competencies in an environment that is autonomy supported, it will not lead to lifelong learning. It will lead to rote memorization, but not lifelong learning. So the importance of creating that engaging environment is very important. The faculty who go through this program report high levels of satisfaction with the program. So these, uh, these percentage are predisposed. So from the beginning of the program to the end of the program, the faculty will report that they're actually better able to write learning outcomes. And they find that very uh, compelling for their redesign. That they're able to use technology in a way that will actually foster student engagement. And that they're able to use their TAs in a more appropriate way. So if a faculty comes in and they have a lot of TAs that they're using as part of their course, that will become a, a part of the redesign. How will you use your TAs in order to meet your learning outcome and objective and creating that environment that is student-centered? The faculty at the end of the program, these are some of the things that... The, uh, they report highly, and that's the advantage of having a very intensive faculty learning community, is that they appreciate the time that they have to work and talk to their colleagues about teaching. And they believe that the program is very valuable. And I think that's important uh, since we are talking about a professional development program like this one at a research intensive institution. To allow faculty that time to think and, and discuss their teaching is extremely valuable. Maybe even more so at a research intensive institution. Okay? They also report that their students are actually getting better. So that's the qualitative, and I'm going to spend just a few minutes after speaking to the quantitative. But the faculty report that their students are actually more engaged. They're a better critical thinker. They're a better problem solver. The faculty see the difference. And you can ask George because he's right there. So if, if it's not true, he'll we'll t- tell you. And here are some of the quantitative pieces of information. This is based on thousands of data. I think this data set has maybe 8,000 students in there. But we see this time and time again. The red bar is when you create an environment that is student-centered. And about 85% of our redesign the first time around are able to do that. And we work with them over time. You get more perceived competence from the students, more perceived autonomy, greater relatedness, and also greater perception of knowledge transfer. Now, these are perceptions. But we know if you're taking a high-stake test and you don't think you can do it, you're not going to be able to do it. So perceptions guide behavior. So this is the perception data. But we also see it in the grade point average. Again, the red bar, high student-centered environment, higher GPA, above 3.0 versus below 3.0. That's critical. That 3.0 is important. Because if you fall below, you can't continue into your major many times. So you lose time, right? Or you may have to change major. Also impacts course rating and instructor rating. These are data on DFW rates, and that's the last thing I'll talk about. So we've seen huge decrease in DFW rates for courses that were, those are from the original courses, our foundational or gateway courses. Now we're not uh, only recruiting these gateway courses, but huge decrease from pre-intervention to post-intervention. In this case, this is in a stat course from 30% to about 14%. What's DFW? 
letter grades of D, F, and withdrawals. So percentage of students who are not able to succeed in the course are actually getting Ds, Fs, and Ws. Uh, this is to show that oh, that's fine. <coughs> from this is a math college algebra course. Um, they have to take this in, in order to move to calculus if they cannot uh, qualify for calculus immediately. From fall 14 to fall 16, these are increases in that question that I talked about. My instructor cares about me. So as the student-centered learning environment increases, we see corresponding decreases in the DFW rate. This one over 55%. And now we're at 30%. And this is not curved. This is actual real scores. Okay. I'm going to turn this over to George. I went a minute over. I promise I wouldn't speak more than 15 minutes. Uh, but George got the interesting stuff. Then we have time for questions. Or you can ask a question now. Or you can ask a question now as I'm trying to. This is where the name tag is problematic. that the TAs are a focus of that course when the faculty is going through the redesign then they're completely involved in the redesign yes so they they become part of what we talk about with the faculty and I think that's why they also report that uh, the faculty learning community really helped them understand how to use their TAs more effectively actually we can we can go on that hi by the way so I'm George Hogg I'm a psychology professor by trade and uh, just in case you're interested in doing team-based kind of things, we're actually written a paper about this, encouraging student engagement through a team-based hybrid course revision of uh, introductory science. So to give you an experience of what it's like to be in the impact program and how much of a difference it makes for both the instructors, the TAs, and the students, I just want to talk to you a little bit about that. So here's that impact. Uh, you've already heard about the program. But the main thing that, that I took away from the program is these sort of three factors that how can we make our courses even more engaging for students? And we know engaging courses. These are the courses that students go back and say, this was the best course ever. These are the, the courses that teachers and students say, yeah, you've got to take this course, man. It's sort of standing room only kind of thing. And they all have this quality of student-centered learning, something where the students care about it. And uh, wildly enough, as part of impact, one of the things we had to do was focus on what it is that you actually want students to learn. And that's sometimes unusual for instructors and faculty. We usually like to just talk about what we know and hope that the students absorb it via osmosis or something like that. But this says, no, focus on what you want the student walking out of your classroom to know. And importantly, how are you going to assess that? How are you going to show that the student actually learned something along those lines? And when we did that for our introductory gateway course, we were kind of horrified to discover that for most courses, especially for our introductory site course, it was too big, too boring, and too passive. Students who were not site majors didn't like it. They hated it. Uh, and you can see, too big. 2,000 students a semester going through. It's easy to like basically drop out. Who would even notice? Your instructor cares about you? Yeah, right. My instructor doesn't even know me, right? There's that famous thing when you're handing in. We also had three large and multiple choice exams. Talk about high stakes testing. You only have to show up three times over the course of the semester, hand in your high stake exam. Of course, there's that apocryphal story. The person handing in the exam, they were really acting up quite a bit, and, and uh, the instructor, like, man, you're going to get in trouble. He says, do you know who I am? The instructor's like, I don't know. So he just slid the exam right in the <coughs> and walked out. 
You don't know what's going on. 2,000 students a semester, at best leave four classes of 500 students, and we know from all sorts of research and student-centered learning that having that many students in a class, it's very hard to get them engaged, it's very hard to get them talking amongst each other, and it's also hard to get them to learn what we wanted them to learn, which in this case was introduce the basics of psychology uh, and introduce what psychology is all about. So when Chantal and Impact said, okay, what do you want, your basic learning outcomes of psychology? We said, well, I think most instructors would say, well, we want them to know psychology as, as a major kind of thing. Give students an appreciation for a hands-on, what is psychology really all about? And specifically, we were able to get together as a group of 10 professors and say, well, three things we'd really like them to know is they should at minimum be able to identify uh, psychological variables, pick out things in a psychological study. So we need to have students walking out of the classroom that at least know what psychology is and can point to a psychological study and how it would work. We'd also like them to be able to interpret <coughs> headlines. These days there are lots of interesting headlines that have a lot to do with psychology. Can students actually interpret those headlines and understand how psychology could help them in their real world application? And of course that's the other question we wanted to know. Can they actually apply concepts to their daily life? Can they actually do anything with the psychology knowledge that we just hopefully demonstrated that they learned. And again, when we looked at it, we saw that the format we were using was not the best format to do. And now again, we keep going back, right? format is not the only thing to change. You can do this in different ways, but you do have to do something different if you're going to make a difference in your students. <laughs> so, right, you, know, you can't just keep doing the same thing again and again and expect to see something different. And so we decided maybe instead of just straight lecture with three large exams, we would do something a little more hybrid. Now, of course, hybrid or teaching folks know what is a hybrid class. Obviously, hybrid cars, you know, combine gas, electric, best in both worlds to get better gas mileage. In a hybrid class, the idea is to combine some of the aspects of large lecture, live interaction with some online technology resources to hopefully uh, the betterment of both. But one thing I knew when we were revising this is this was not hybrid. The sort of large lecture format where you go in front of 500 students and it's a large lecture course. And the thing I most remember is it's so passive. The students are sleeping. They're not paying any attention. They're sitting there in the back. And then you feel like it, it really is like the Roman Coliseum, Russell Crowe and Gladiator, right? Are you not entertained? No. <laughs> And we know, of course, there are better ways to entertain these days. I can watch Russell Crowe in my pajamas, at the, you know, online, in my own leisure, no problems. And we definitely figured that there has to be a better way for students to learn this psychology concept. And, and our initial attempt was to flip the class. Because early on, we were thinking, well, maybe flipping the class. How many people here heard of flipping the classroom? So this should be fairly obvious, right? Uh, the traditional classroom, lecture, you get the lecture in class, then you do the activities or struggle with exercises at home. Uh, and the idea behind flipping the class is, well, you just completely reverse that. You do the lecture at home, online, and you struggle with the exercises in class when you sort of have help and personalized attention. And we thought that this would be a good way to adopt a student-centered focus. Now, instead of having these giant lectures, we can have smaller recitations where the students actually talk to us about that. And the way we actually did that is we took a traditional one-hour large lecture that met three times a week of 414 students and broke it up into 656 students now watching online lectures for two hours a week and then coming in, broken up into much smaller sections. The sections had to be smaller than 100, ideally much smaller than 100, to try and get some kind of hands-on group activity things going on. And we know from research and social psychology that groups less than 100 students can actually start to form coalescing the groups, they start to know each other a little bit better. And I have to say, when I first walked into one of these little recitation sections, I thought, yeah, this is going to make a big difference. Because now, all of a sudden, you can sit down and talk with students one-on-one -on -one instead of sort of looking at the giant sea of faces. And um, that's what we did. So we went in there, and okay, what we found <coughs> This is a team-based revision. So we had 10 Purdue psychology professors come up with their best lecture, the things that they thought students should learn. And there's some nice things about having Purdue professors record their lecture. The first thing is something that many people and students have suggested. You can finally pause that professor who's talking too fast. You can replay it. And what was that? Was it writing furiously? You can go back and you can replay it and say, oh, yes, that's what it was. Um, you can actually involve many professors. So for the first time, 
uh, we can have experts in each of the areas giving their little preview of what their particular area was. And this was neat because you could you know, see the developmental psychology from a developmental psychologist. You could hear about social psychology from a real life social psychologist. And many students now then go on to take their actual courses in social and developmental. So this was a way of previewing what people were doing. Of course, we could add captions as well. And consistency was another big thing. Uh, obviously, psychology covers a lot of ground. Having these professors <coughs> finally get together and say, this is what we want students to walk away learning, helped us keep consistency across the entire course. And I think that's probably the most important thing from a content standpoint, is having everybody agree, this is what we want students to learn. And if you have group agreement about that, it's much easier to standardize it. It has to come from both, from those 10 professors who are saying, yeah, this is what we want students to learn. It can't be top down, kind of, here's what you must learn. Work much better. And captions actually served out pretty important for our English as a second language students. But the other thing was, we had these live recitations in sort of an active learning room, kind of like this, where the students can get together and talk in small groups of up to nine students. And here, that's high interaction. It's students talking with other students. It's an engineering student sharing with another engineering student an equation for how that might work. I don't understand what they're saying, but it actually worked in and explained. So you have students that can actually explain some of the concepts to each other even better than the psychology professor could. It's inherently student-focused. They get to develop those skills that, remember the thing we said was so important that students learn how to do? <coughs> and this was something we also thought was demonstrably not better on come on in, actually come here because you can sit in one of these classrooms and get involved in a way that sitting in a standard lecture you couldn't. And for a large percentage of students, it made a big difference. Uh, we have uh, these sort of specialized rooms that were done from the libraries. Uh, we put in your sort of, there used to be stacks of books, we don't need as many books anymore, <laughs> they're all digital online kind of things. And you had the students in here with whiteboards and huddle boards and students could present with each other. And uh, again, the first time you walk into one of these, you're like, man, this is, this is really what education is about. The students are actually interacting with each other. There's hubbub. There's something going on here that's a little different than the typical boring old college lecture where half the people are asleep. And so, did we get student engagement from this? Did it work? Well, here's one thing I thought was interesting. 60% attendance lecture, large lecture, ordinary. That's actually being rather optimistic. If you come into large lecture some days, you're lucky it's just a professor and like four other students. <laughs> Once we started doing these tiny little recitations, we had 95% of attendance. Now, part of that is the students want to be there to support their group, but they're obviously behaviorally engaged in what they're doing. And then we can also ask them survey sorts of questions similar to what you saw Chantal talk about before. How do you rate the course? How do you rate the instructor? We can ask them specific questions like, you know, as a result, do you think you made gains in identifying variables in the psychology experiment? Do you think you can recognize concepts of psychology and apply them in your life? And what we found is, yes, in every possible measure we could come up with, students did better in the hybrid course over the lecture course. Their ratings of the instructor, their ratings of the course, even their idea that the format helped learning was higher. Uh, they said they could identify variables, they said they could apply concepts, they could interpret findings, all of these things came up. But was what was most interesting for me was their open-ended responses. We had these kind of questions like, hey, we welcome your written comments below. What's something or some things you think the instructor does? Well, something you hope that the instructor will continue to do in this class in the future. Make some suggestions for improving the course. And here's some typical hybrid comments. Let's introduce this to some, some of the most important material the chapters. I like the idea of a hybrid course. This was fun. The students were excited about it. I really enjoyed the hybrid course. Interested to be in a small class presentation. I enjoyed the idea of working with the same group every week. We shared similar and different perspectives on all topics. So here's something that you couldn't have done if you were watching it online necessarily. Um, I like the hybrid nature of the class, they said. By the way, notice those words. I like. I really enjoy. There's a balance there. There's an emotional connection. Some students think this is the best class we've had. I don't think those necessarily. Uh, I like this one. The videos are better than reading. OK, good to know. Um, and then when we talked about specifically the activities that they were doing in class, the students found a great deal of value in those activities. I said they, they helped a lot. I felt that today's class was extremely helpful. I, I didn't realize when we designed a toy or a game for each of Piaget's developmental stages, we thought that was wonderful. I now understand the stages. So in doing these activities, they're actually learning more about what we want them to learn. I never really thought before that psychology would play a part in the development of toys for children, but now I think about it, it really does make sense. 
So that's good. They're actually making a connection between what they're learning in class and what they thought they should learn. Here's a few lecture comments. Uh, they're not all like this, but here's some ones that sort of stick out in my mind. I do not like how the whole course is based off of making tests. Teachers need to realize that some students are awful test takers, so basing the class based off of this is not a great idea. I've heard that before. Lecture was very boring. I've attended every lecture and regretted it. The <laughs> professor knows his material. Maybe the class is just boring in and of itself. I will say, it just kind of goes on and on. Things happen that way. So it was the most disappointing to me. I was disappointed with this class. I've gone to every lecture and read every chapter, and I'm still not doing well in the course. I feel like I should benefit from going to class, but it doesn't help. If I took this course over again, I wouldn't come to class because I learned more from the book than from him. So this is kind of a contrast that's happening here. Students in the hybrid course said, hey, we thought the activities were really good. Students in the lecture course said, I hope I didn't come. And so you can quantify that to a certain extent. And what we did is we can actually look at the degree to which student comments were like, I love this course, this was great, the best course ever, and I hated this course. And of course, it showed up more when we asked them for comments and criticisms in the course. Of course, that's when it's going to show up. But one of the things I noticed here in the lecture, especially, um, more than 50% of the students in lecture were either extremely disaffected or disaffected in their responses to the course. So they're complaining about lecture. When you, what did you like about it? I hated the lecture. There was something wrong. They actually used those words. So this is something else that obviously an engaging course is what you're trying for. You don't want students to be that upset. And we did have some student success. Uh, same kind of things. 40% had a B or better in the large lecture course. More than 70% were going to be or better by the end of the hybrid course. That makes a difference with success. This is an introductory course. It's supposed to be one of those courses they take early on, and they're succeeding in doing better. And again, that drop, withdrawal, failure, had a lot fewer students dropping out. 30% you know, of the students were essentially dropping out of the course in the lecture with only maybe 10, 15% of students previously. And, and I'll just leave you with one other thing. What about different types of students? So that was the first thing we did. We flipped the class. And, and if you go from this, you might walk away saying, man, we just got to flip all our classes. I know our, our university president saw that and said, yeah, look at this. This is great. The student's acting. You can probably already think there's some students for whom an interactive, highly intense class might not be the best format. One of the things we found is that for students, um, Oh, by the way, that format is pretty good, especially for exploratory study students. These are students who weren't even decided. They did really well with that. Pre-pharmacy. Uh, you'll notice the science students did OK. I mean, there's an effect of all this. The green is the, the hybrid course. The blue is the lecture. It helps, but it doesn't help equally for all students. And, and one of the biggest things we noticed was that students for whom English is a second language did not necessarily like the hybrid sections. Because all of a sudden, you're being put in a small group where you have to explain yourself in front of everybody else when this may be your first semester speaking English for the first time you know, in, in, a, in a reliable situation. So um, you thought, how might that compare? And what we found is the students for whom English was a second language, we could take those same videos, put them in an online course, do the same kinds of activities in an online discussion forum. And actually, that was the one case where uh, students did better in online. So having that online course for students for whom English is a second language helps. And it kind of makes sense. They're thinking that they have just a little bit more time to come up with what they want to say. They're not as <coughs> on the spot. Also students who are very nervous about things um, didn't have to worry about uh, being, being on the spot either. And uh, so this has led us to say, you know, maybe we need to improve these things as well. Uh, that it, it isn't necessarily about flipping the class. It isn't necessarily about the format. In fact, no format is perfect for every student, and it's about customizing the level of engagement for the needs of the particular student that you're focusing on. So as I mentioned, online definitely seems to be better for English as a second language students. Uh, those online discussion forums are a great way for students to delve into the topic a little bit more. Um, the other thing we noticed is there were some students for whom live lectures still had the advantage. And that is, if you're not a very, hmm, responsible student, maybe you don't want to watch the online lectures, having a class that you come to three times a week can make it more likely that you show up and do that better. So we wanted to provide opportunities for them. And if they did come to a live class, are there ways we can make it not so passive? And so we started using uh, Poet anywhere. I don't know if you all have seen that. It's basically a way of texting in your class responses from your cell phone. 
a hot seat is sort of the Purdue specific one of that. That's been very uh, fortunate when we uh, test uh, live. So you can do a live lecture, people text in their own responses, and you can get a response from everybody. So even though it's a large course, you can still participate, and there's still some degree of uh, expectation. So those are the kind of things. Like I said, no format is perfect, but as we use the methods that, that Chantal and others have showed, what do you want them to learn, measure how they're learning it, and change the course to make it better and better along the way. And we did. The advisors actually prompted us, among other things, that's become pretty obvious. Um, as we know, what that is, the advisors kind of point the students to their preferred medium. Uh, I've shared this example before, but I'll never forget. One time we went to the hybrid section, and I had a student who was absolutely blood drained out, totally ashen, going, I, I'm socially phobic. I thought this was an online course. I didn't realize I'd have to come into class once a week, and this is really freaking me out. Man. So I'm like, OK, I think the online course would be better for you. And, and, and it doesn't have to be that you're socially phobic. Some people just would like a little extra time to compose their thoughts, to share what they're thinking. And just, uh, I would add on to that, that I think having a discussion forum or something where students can have a chance to reflect and come back to it actually works very well to help solidify the kinds of things that they're learning in lectures. You can do that in a large lecture format or other things as well. But having the advisors, and we also tell the students that too, is a little bit of a shifting time right around uh, the time classes start you can explain hey this is a hybrid course there's a large lecture course that's running down and this is down this hall you can take that one or you can do this one as well and then students can uh, sort themselves out that way as well <laughs> so I want to I want to ask about the faculty development part of it so it's a semester long what's involved in that what are the kinds of meeting schedules and activities that are involved for the faculty that They meet uh, once a week. There's actually 13 meetings, so there's a couple of breaks that we take uh, in that time. They meet for an hour and 15 minutes every time that we meet, and we run it as a hybrid course. Um, so they have, uh, there's a Blackboard site. The syllabus is online, and I said I would share the syllabus with Matt, so um, this uh, can share with all of you. We, um, they have uh, work to do, things to read, videos to watch before they come to class. Typically, I would say about 30 minutes to sometimes an hour. There's a couple sessions where there's more readings to do. When they come to class, it's really to work with their support team in this faculty uh, community. So we often have three faculty working with three support team members around round tables like this. And that's where we really talk about the application of what they've read to their redesign. They will also meet with their team outside of the FLC, outside of the F faculty learning community, uh, regularly. Sometimes once a week, every other week is probably more uh, typical, and that's when they really work on the redesign with their team. And then we follow them for three iterations after this semester of work. Because as they implement, as the faculty implement, questions will arise. Be like, oh, I, I'm trying this. This is not working. Help me. So we work with them. Does that help with the? <laughs> so I'm curious about the sustainability piece of it, um, especially after those three iterations and how that's been working out in terms of you know, with faculty turnover in terms of who's teaching the course and that sort of thing, that has sort of kept on. That's true. Uh, for, for some of the department, let's say for the math department, it's been a departmental-wide initiative. So faculty have come together, worked together during the faculty learning community, and have redesigned the calculus sequence, 
and um, college algebra. All of the faculty are bought in. They, um, so in this case, the sustainability is not a problem at all. It's the same for psychology as well. You can talk more about that. In other departments, it's more of an issue. It's something that we really kind of think about often. Um, the faculty sign a service level agreement, which the department heads sign as well, and the dean signs as well. There's at least an expectation that the faculty will get to teach the course for three iterations. So they sign on that. But then after that, then we have to have a conversation. There's also part of the service level agreement, the SLA, that says that if you are not going to teach this course anymore, there's an expectation that you'll talk to the next person that is going to come into this course, that you'll share what you have done. That Not that you have to do exactly the same thing, because it's not necessarily format based. And then there's a, what we call Impact 2.0. So a new faculty coming in, coming in can come to Impact to, for the same course, but because it's a different person, they also get funding, not the same level of funding, because they can we want some collaborative work done, uh, but we support that faculty also in, in the 2.0 version. That's the short answer, but we... Yeah, no, it's, it's a huge issue, and, and again, this is why it's so important to get the departmental buy-in to think of the course as this is a department course. I know for psychology, it was this is a prerequisite course. What are you expecting to have taught in this class for your upper-level courses? So having the social psychologist come in and say, yeah, they need to cover this, this, and this, and that's what I expect them to know, good, you teach that, and they put it in the learning outcomes too. So our syllabus now has those learning outcomes right in it, it's listed by the registrar, so anyone who's gonna come in after the fact, besides already being part of this, most likely has to do that, has to stick to those same learning outcomes. So at least they're gonna be asked, how well do you meet those particular outcomes? A question about the psychology course. How or what? How did you change your assessment, or did you? How did you change well, your assessment, or did you? So we've actually, yeah, we changed both this assessment asking those questions. <laughs> well, as soon as we came up with the learning outcomes, we're asking specifically the degree to which the students found that. We also created a, a knowledge test, the basic psychology knowledge that we thought that each of the areas thought that they should know, and tested that. Um, so we have changed the, the assessment, and that has then fed back into, well, what are we, how do we change the course to make this and that better? Sorry. Um, so did that supplant or replace the previous three large tests? Uh, it's supplanted. We still have the three large tests because we want to be able to compare how students did on those tests, but they now take quizzes pretty much every week online that they can go in. And this is one thing that's worth. If you're making students watch an online video, you better have a way of showing that they actually watched it or at least giving them some reward for watching it. In this case, it's a very simple quiz, kind of. If you watched it, you could answer it, and they have to do that and prove that they actually watched the quiz and saw that. So we, we do that, and that's a way to give them a, a toe in the water, a low stakes testing sort of situation for the same kind of things that will show up in the high stakes testing later on. And that seems to work pretty well. Um, so I, I, I was kind of curious about this too, because you showed that the grades went up, but uh, uh, because you changed the assessment structure, there are multiple reasons why grades go up. And so in the exam, you mentioned that you kind of left the exam flow. Do you have a baseline to show that you actually know the content that you care about better? Yeah, well, of course, it's a little, yes, they did better in the exam, specifically on the kinds of questions and things that we were asking about. But it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem because, of course, we already said we want them to identify the variables in the experiment. They're going to spend several days identifying variables in the experiment and doing these activities. If they didn't get better, I'd be pretty surprised in, in the same way, um, yeah. The, the, you know, different instructors tend to emphasize different things. Like one instructor I teach developmental doesn't do developmental at all. Well, they did much better developmental questions in my class. Well, duh. You know, there's a sense in which it's, it's, it's hard. But the other thing we wanted to get at is, too, is this isn't just a matter of I like the course or I'm getting, because I'm getting higher grades. It's I actually will recommend this course to other other students. I actually thought this was a valuable course. I care about it in a way that, and that's why we're trying to get more of the emotional engagement aspect of the course as well, and touching some Well, we're at one o'clock, so um, I know that uh, Chantal and George will be here if people want to continue the conversation. But I'd like to thank them for a very engaging.